I've been watching Neil since he was at day one with very few subscribers and look at how he's grown now. Make sure you subscribe. But he had Del C. Allison Jr. on, one of my favorite theologians on New Testament studies. And I asked Del some of these questions pertaining to Jesus' historicity, but also apocalyptic thought. Was Jesus a felled prophet? Did he predict certain things that did not come to pass? And is cognitive dissonance something that explains the criteria? Also, if we look closely at what's going on in the New Testament, we see a gradual tendency to veer toward a, a vertical interpretation of the kingdom of God and some of the expectations of fulfillment. Is this how full preterism was birthed? These ideas that we're learning about came from the idea that it felled? These are things to consider as we enter this entire episode. Make sure you subscribe to Neil. Derek from Myth Vision has a great question and it's would you say the purpose of revelation is the hopeful soon end of the roman empire of the jewish people and is it safe to say this book failed <laughs> <That's how> <laughs> well <laughs> look i think the the book of revelation hopes for a near end and it certainly looks for the end of uh, the roman empire because it thinks of the roman empire as in uh, league with the dragon as in league with Satan. So it's very anti, um, anti-Roman, right? Absolutely. And, and the end of the book is, is, is the end of Rome. Uh, is it safe to say that this book failed? Well, it depends on, on what you're doing. If you're looking, uh, at the book of Revelation as a sort of blueprint as to what would happen later and that the end would come soon, then I, I, I think you have to be honest and say, yeah, it failed. On the other hand, I'm not sure that the book is primarily about pro, uh, you know, predicting exactly what the future is. The way this works, it seems to me, is that the book of Revelation um, goes up and down between heaven and earth. There are these uh, ascents to heaven where you see what's really going on behind the scenes, where you see what's going on uh, at the throne of God and so on. And I, I think that this is a book for people in difficult times. I th I'm one who thinks that some Christians have been killed. Uh, there are a few martyrs at this point. Maybe this is the last decade of the first century and um, the reign of Domitian and, and, and the author <clears throat> and uh, the community's address know some people who have been arrested and even a few people who've been killed. Uh, it's not a great time. And uh, of course, the world is always difficult for some people. So it's looking at the world, it's admitting that it's terrible and that it's horrible, but it's hoping that it will soon end. But in the middle of that, it's not just waiting for the end. You have these glimpses of some sort of transcendent reality, which is above all this. And I think those would function as encouragement. So I think uh, if you want to say that this book literally fails, uh, in terms of predicting the day, yeah, everybody who's done that uh, or hope for that has failed. But um, I think the book would have made people feel better. Uh, okay, M maybe uh, some sort of theological therapy or therapeutic theology, however you want to put this, or therapeutic apocalyptic. Uh, it's healthy to think these evils that I see aren't going on forever, and they're ultimately not uh, the foundation of reality. That's, that's something more, that's something beyond that. So, uh, that's how I would answer that. I think. Good, good, good question. And great answer. And his follow up with this, once again, subscribe to myth vision podcast, Derek, once again, how does the failed apocalyptic fervor of the new Testament help with the historical Jesus? Does the failed apocalyptic expectations help to see help us see Jesus? Well, uh, I'm somebody who's famous or infamous for arguing that Jesus himself hoped for a near end, which did not come to pass. So for me, being honest with that question helps me as an historian and helps me understand the records. And, and I would say that uh, early Christianity inherited its hope for a near end from from Jesus. So from that point of view, yeah, this certainly um, 
helps. If you're if you're looking at the text, in my judgment, if you're looking at the text and trying to explain away eminent eschatology or explain everything that looks like a disappointed hope, I don't think you're going to find uh, the historical truth. So I guess from that point, if that's what the question is about, this helps me uh, understand the historical Jesus. Interesting. Very, very good answer. Thank you for that. He's back for another one, though. He's not done. <laughs> okay. He's, he's trying to get you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The kingdom of God. What did it mean by Jesus? And how does it reinterpreting this in the New Testament show us the apocalyptic, apocalyptic Jesus failed? Cognitive dissonance? He's going hard on this failed thing. Uh, okay. So the kingdom of God. What did it mean by what did it mean by Jesus? What did it mean to Jesus, maybe, is what he meant? Yeah. Means. And and I would revert back to what I said earlier. I think this is the kingdom of God on earth. This is a transformed world. I think it involves judgment, resurrection, uh, and punishment of the wicked and, and those sorts of things, the fulfillment of traditional eschatological expectations. Uh, again, did the apocalyptic Jesus fail? Well, yes, he failed. If you're going to uh, insist on saying that what he was all about is predicting uh, uh, a near end, I I think, I hope I'm not being defensive here, but I think you'd have to say from another point of view, this guy did not fail. Uh, he, he somehow gave birth to a tradition that ended up uh, giving us Paul and the four gospels and ultimately, I suppose, the Christian religion. So there has to be more to him than just uh, an expectation that failed. Uh, he was also a healer. He was also charismatic. He's also a very interesting moral teacher. There are many things to him besides this, this one, uh, eschatological expectation. There's also the conviction of the early Christians that somehow this guy didn't stay dead, but, uh, he turned up again after he had gone. So there are a number of things that seem to me to overcome uh, what would have been cognitive dissonance. That is, the, the delay of the end would have created problems. I think they're visible in the New Testament. I think they're visible, for example, in John 21. I actually think they're visible throughout the entire Gospel of John, which seems to me to be a sort of reinterpretation of the tradition. That is, the tradition uh, is looking for the transcendent in the future. And while the Gospel of John doesn't give up, on that, I think it focuses on the transcendent in the present. Uh, so that's a way of dealing with disappointment, or if you will, uh, cognitive uh, dissonance. Uh, Myth Vision Podcast is back. Was the end expected in the New Testament cosmic? Okay, so uh, in in New Testament circles, I suppose this question is associated very much with. N.T. Wright or, or Tom Wright, who says that um, mainstream German scholarship and people like me have gone astray because we've talked about the end. And for us, that means the end of the space-time universe. And he says that's not uh, in the New Testament. It's not in the Hebrew Bible and so on. I agree with them. And I never thought that the, the New Testament authors were looking for uh, the end of the space-time universe, but they might have been looking for something like a cosmic catastrophe. I think they are looking at the remaking of nature, and I think they are looking for something like the rabbi in my earlier story. That is, they are looking for something that is so radical, so transformative, that it will be obvious to, to everyone. It won't be like Pentecost or the, the church or AD 70 or the resurrection of Jesus, all of which are ambiguous things which can be interpreted in multiple ways. I think for the early Christians, the coming of this kingdom is the solution to the problem of evil. And that means the end of the sort of, of ambiguities and miseries that, that we've had ever since the first century and that humanity has always had. So um, I think that, uh, you, you know, is it cosmic? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure that's the important question. The question is, is it radical transformation of the world as it is? And the answer to that is yes. Now, uh, let me add a sort of footnote to that, which is that um, in Mark 13, 
uh, Matthew 24, it says that the stars will uh, fall from the sky. And uh, Wright thinks that this is obvious symbolism. To me, it's not obvious symbolism. Um, you have to remember that in the first century, uh, stars weren't what they are for us. Stars are these gigantic uh, balls of, of gas and energy that are uh, light years away from us, right? And they can't fall down from, from the heavens. But if you're a first century person, you you and you don't have modern lighting you actually see fall stars fall from the sky all the time because they're we actually today we still call them falling stars right because it looks like a star that is falling right if you are talking about first century knowledge these people think because they see it that stars can fall from the sky they even see uh, meteor showers occasionally where a bunch of them fall and they don't know that there's a distinction between the lights they're seeing fall and the lights that are staying up there in the firmament. And it doesn't stretch my uh, credulity at all to think that a first century person could think, yeah, when the, when the end comes, they're all going to fall down, right? Because I see it happen in part uh, all the time. So I don't, I don't, um, I don't think that has to be a symbol, just as I don't think the sun going dark at the crucifixion of Jesus was intended to be purely symbolic. It is a symbol, but I also think the authors thought it happened. I think that's the way they narrate it, um, not as a Haggadic legend, but as something that really did happen. Interesting. Thank you for that answer. Um, Derek has another question. He's just all over you today. You better go back on his channel soon because he's got a lot of questions for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, criticisms of full preterism, Dr. Allison. Uh, well, that just goes against everything I've been saying so far. Uh, it's a way to, to save the text so that they are all fulfilled in the first century. Uh, this view, I think, is right in that the text is about or originally intended to be about the first century, but I don't see how you can read AD 70 and, and other first century events into it and say that it is, uh, it has been fulfilled. Again, for me, the, these people are looking for something that transcends anything that has ever happened. <clears throat> and if you view Revelation as though it's fulfilled in the first century, then that means that the hopes and dreams of this author have been fulfilled. And that doesn't make sense to me. If I, I again, uh, to go back to the genre question, nobody reads fourth, nobody, nobody reads fourth Ezra along the lines of fulfillment in the first century or second Baruch or first Enoch. They, they just don't do that. And Revel Revelation belongs to the same group uh, of documents. And these are all people who are hoping for something that has not come, has never come. Interesting. And, <clears throat> and also, did Revelation imagine a literal thousand year reign? Oh, okay. That's possible. That's quite possible. Uh, I think it does uh, envisage a literal um, period of a messianic reign. And I think that it's already um, representing a view that you find in the rabbis. So the rabbis, or some of them anyway, in some places, distinguish between uh, the messianic age and the world to come. So the messianic age is a period on earth when the Messiah reigns. And then after that, uh, and the, the periods or length of time for that differ, then, then you have this completely transcendent uh, world. I think Revelation already shows you that sort of uh, thinking. By the way, that sort of thinking, I believe, comes from a reflection on the Hebrew Bible, on the Old Testament, because some of the prophecies seem kind of mundane, and others of them seem cosmic and transcendent. And trying to put all this together, I think you end up with Two, uh, two slightly different views. I think they're all mashed together in the New Testament and for, for Jesus. I don't think they're sorted out. But people in the first century are already trying to sort them out. I think Revelation in part testifies to that, and certainly the rabbis 
uh, testify to that. And by the, by the way, I should add that <clears throat> the idea of a millenarian kingdom or a millennium becomes a heresy later on in uh, early Christianity, and people like Origen reject it completely. But I think the dominant view in the second century is still for a sort of earthly reign uh, of the Messiah. It's in Justin Martyr, it's in Irenaeus. Um, and I think that's more uh, in accord with uh, first century expectation. Wow, thank you for that answer. And by the way, I just wanna say, for such a intense, uh, difficult topic, these answers are awesome. So I just want to throw that at you real quick. Thank you for this. This is this is good content right here. Myth Vision Podcast. <laughs> Derek, what's going on? Subscribe back. Subscribe to the Myth Vision if you haven't. You're living under a rock. Anyways, do you think Christian Gnosticism was birthed by the failed apocalypse? John's gospel likes realized eschatology, as does Gospel of Thomas. Thoughts? Okay, so uh, I guess I'd give a qualified yes to this. Wow. So... Um, I, as I said earlier, I think that what you're seeing in the Gospel of John is not the rejection of transcendence in the future, but a, a shift so that the emphasis is is on what is obtainable now, the, the kingdom of God in the present, and, and so on. And I think that uh, the potential for that is always there. I think the potential for that is there with Jesus because he has a sort of realized eschatology. But the longer... The end does not come. The more certain people are motivated to to find um, their solutions uh, in a vertical reality rather than waiting for the future, which which doesn't arrive. So one of the things I have hoped to do, I haven't been able to do it yet. I really would like to look at what happens to movements that have uh, a near end expectation and it's important for them. And then there's a sense that the end didn't come. Does what you see in the Gospel of John also occur in part in Gnosticism? Uh, I think that's probably part of the answer. Uh, is this what you see in maybe the early Shakers, which start off with a very strong idea of a second coming, but then become mystics in short order after the end doesn't arrive. I I would like to look at a bunch of cross-cultural movements. I would like to, to do this comparative thing. I've also wondered about the ghost dance and then the peyote cult. The ghost dance is eminent expectation. We're going to have the ancestors. They're going to come back. Uh, these white jerks are going to leave. They're going to be driven out. Things are going to come back to the way they should be. Wow. And then it doesn't happen. And, and everything is miserable. And then you get the mysticism of the peyote cult. At least I think that might be what's going on. So I have these suspicions, wow. but I've never tried to put it all together in an academic way. Uh, maybe I'm too old to do that. I still like to think I'm not, and I, I might try this down the road. But yeah, I do think the Gospel of John is in a, a, an important sense, an attempt to reinterpret the, the tradition so that the focus is on a sort of present mysticism rather than an eschatological hope, which has not come as, as people had hoped. Join MythVision's Patreon today to access hundreds of videos that I have worked hard in high quality content that are not in public domain. They're only on the Patreon. You will also have direct access to me, referring academics, questions, ideas, or just want a private chat. You have that access with me. Also, I'm trying to do more traveling to educate people from more academics and expand what kind of material I do produce on MythVision. This is a full-time gig and you're helping the community by joining. I'm trying to put together more to educate people who have harmful cultic practices or ways in which they're harming society. We are educating them from myth vision on better understanding these ancient texts and mythologies and history in a way like not many shows do. So please, I could use your help and you're going to get and benefit a lot by joining as a member.